Hello and welcome to your lecture on California's water resources for your Geography of California course. So, uh, well first, welcome. Uh, secondly, we can't talk about California's water resources without mentioning a lot about the Los Angeles aqueduct. So we'll be discussing where water has uh, come from, uh, where it is going, how much we get, what do we do with it, uh, really just understanding the fundamentals of the fact that California, as we've previously learned, is incredibly diverse when looking at our climate and looking at our weather, But and that's not even to mention our biodiversity, but the fact that water is not evenly distributed amongst the state, and so where do we get it and how do we get it around? So the images that I, I put on my opening slide here uh, perhaps look familiar. This is the uh, spillway there, the Los Angeles spillway at the right below the 514 split, um, the freeway split. This is uh, an iconic piece of our history of 1913 because this was a pivotal change in the story of Los Angeles and California as a whole. Uh, after this point, we saw a boom in population, we saw a boom in agriculture, in fact we saw uh, plentiful amounts of water to the point that it was being wasted because you can't stop the aqueduct, it can only be diverted. It's siphon fed, so it uh, it will always run. If it's not spilling over uh, there, the, the spillway that you see, it's being diverted to a reservoir or dam um, it cannot stop uh, unless there's no water. Uh, so that was learned very quick, and so we'll talk a little bit about that history too. But uh, you know, this was a, an iconic piece of Los Angeles and California history. So let us begin. Um, so, oop, where did I go? There I am. <laughs> Sorry, I'm, this is new. The whole uh, putting me and the PowerPoint. So where does the water go? Well. About 75% of all precipitation in California is lost to e evapotranspiration and evaporation. So what does that mean? Well, whenever we receive precipitation, a majority of it will just evaporate again off the surface, or it will be, it will be absorbed by vegetation and then evaporated there. So it's a complete loss um, to us as, as humans as, when we want to deal uh, predominantly with storage. Uh, California's, uh, California's average precipitation varies. Uh, mo Death Valley gets less than two inches of rain per year. Most uh, high desert regions get about five inches, yet uh, it's not impossible for coast er coastal, northern coastal areas to receive over 100 inches. That being said, about 80% of California's water is still used in agriculture, and kind of sticking with that number of 80, the average person in California uses 80 gallons of water per day. Now, that doesn't mean that you're drinking 80 gallons of water today, but that means between uh, you know the sinks, toilets, showers, and even taking into consideration the food that we eat. Some people, if you think about it, it will be a lot more. The average California almond is, takes 10 gallons to make that little almond. So if you have a handful of almonds, how much water have you technically consumed? Um, and then that brings us into, since we obviously require a lot of water and it's not evenly distributed amongst the state, that brings us into the Los Angeles, the water wars. This is a, a photo here I took of uh, Mono Lake in northeastern California. Uh, Mono Lake is actually the, the crater of a super volcano that then all the melt water from around fills the lake. But that was a reservoir that was used uh, in a chain of lakes that we actually drew water from pretty much from that northeast corner of California all the way down to uh, Los Angeles. Uh, there's been some uh, situations with that, with the preservation of the Mono Lake Committee and the reservoir itself. So they actually removed the dam itself because there's a, an island in the middle, uh, which is part of a volcanic plug. And that island is where uh, a very unique uh, species of gull lay their eggs and when the lake had desiccated and dried up uh, the coyotes and other animals were able to get to that island to eat the eggs and it became uh, a very uh, a very negative impact on the environmental standards so nonetheless we will continue to discuss these changes now I'm going to click this button which means I'm going to go away all right so where does the water go? Well, so this is what we call a climograph. A climograph shows the average climate, uh, looking at day-to-day -day weather for very long periods of time, usually in the range of 30 years. So this is a, a Los Angeles climograph. So as we, you know, I'll bring my mouse up on the screen here. So the blue columns uh, represent precipitation, and then the red line represents temperatures. So these are average temperatures. So these are taking in considerations high during the day and low at night and averaging it out. So we can see that our warmest months start up in May, move into June, July, August, September, October, then it cools back down again. 
We can see that a majority of our precipitation is found at the first of the year, January, February, and March. Uh, as you can see here, um, our annual precipitation on average has been 396 millimeters, which is uh, like 15 and a half inches or so of rain on average. On average, so that does to take into consideration that there are times in which we will receive less and times that we can receive more. Uh, historically, within the last decade, this number has been significantly less. This year is an anomaly. It's been raining a lot this year, this year being uh, the early 2020. So, uh, but nonetheless, we can see that this is that range. If you think about it, it makes sense. I mean, um, you know, whatever month that you're in when you're watching this. So as an example, this is in March. So we can see we get quite a bit of rain in March, but then also in April, you know, not as much, and then it dries up in May into our warmest season, June, July, August. So anyway, this is kind of looking at the average of just Los Angeles alone. So we only get about 15 and a half inches of rain, yet we have a bulk of the population. So let's move into the Los Angeles water war. Here I am again. Uh, so this is an interesting story. I'm going to try to keep it brief, but I, I, this is really interesting to me uh, because it's not often spoke about. Um, so Los Angeles recognized that water was needed in, for, in order for that community to grow. So we'll have to you know, acknowledge the fact that we're talking about a Los Angeles at the turn of the, of, you know, the last century, looking at 1880 on. That This is Los Angeles, this photo. I mean, that's not what we idealize it as today. You know, so there's no way that Los Angeles would be the megalopolis that it is today had this water war not occurred. Um, so it's kind of one of those double-edged swords. You know, it's not necessarily good for the environmental impact, as we'll talk about. But then again, we would not be here uh, the way that we are today had this not been the resource. So at that point, Fred Eaton, uh, Eaton, if you've ever been to the Pasadena area, uh, there's a can Eaton Canyon is named after him. He was actually the mayor of Los Angeles. And um, he, I, I kind of give the story away here at the beginning, but he was the mayor. Uh, he realized that we needed additional water resources if we wanted Los Angeles to become an actual city. Uh, so he reached out to his friend William Mulholland um, and asked him to design an aqueduct. Uh, they had done a lot of reconnaissance or research looking up in the eastern Sierra. At that point, the eastern Sierra, which is like um, just beyond uh, the Coso Mountain Range, so Lone Pine and North. Uh, at that point, it was just finishing up its big agriculture boom. Uh, there was a tremendous amount of agriculture, but then they had noticed that a lot of the climate began to change dramatically. Uh, right after the, the uh, mid-1800s, the climate began changing. It became a lot warmer, and they weren't getting enough precipitation, but they got a lot of snow melt. So they had a lot of reservoirs. And so uh, Fred Eaton and William Mulholland realized that this is a great resource to just, could we build... Uh, a tube, uh, not an open one. We have an open aqueduct. That's the California aqueduct. That takes water on the western side of the Sierra. This is all eastern side. They wanted to create a tube that would actually siphon like a straw the water from these reservoirs all the way down to Los Angeles. So uh, they reached out to the federal government. They got uh, all kinds of people involved, all kinds of funding involved. This is going to be a great thing. William Mulholland designed all of this moving forward. Um, they sat up with the government. This is how we're going to do it. We're going to go out and buy. Um, they were already in, in negotiation with the people that live in that area. We're going to buy the water rights, locations. We're going to take this and this and this. And uh, in that process, when everything was being designed, Fred Eaton went up and bought everything up. He bought everything from the uh, the locals because their farms were struggling anyway, and so he promised them a lot of money, so he paid them a lot of money and took everything away from them. Um, and uh, so when when William Mulholland went to approach that, they said, well, the people have already sold the land. In fact, the now ex-mayor Fred Eaton uh, owns it all, so they had to pay it at an exorbitant rate, so he took advantage of the system. Uh, Fred Eaton then retired, bought his little ranch out in Pasadena, and lived happily ever after with all of his money. Uh, William That actually destroyed their friendship uh, between uh, William and Fred, but uh, nonetheless, William Mulholland began working through. He actually was the first big wig of the Los Angeles Department of Water and Power. Uh, he continued to design things. So it took from 1909 to 1913 to build the aqueduct. So what does that look like? Oop, I'm gone again. So here's the aqueduct. What's interesting about this is they built an, a, a tube system. As you can see, it's quite large. It ran uh, just shy of 400 miles. It runs all the way from... Um, 
uh, Lone Pine area up and over through mountains around because it was it's siphon fed. So you have to have the appropriate number of ups and downs in order to continue that water to run. And then it spills over into a very few areas. I think it's somewhere around 90% of it is covered, which is great because that prevents evaporation to occur. But uh, what was interesting is a lot of the terrain was not easily accessible so these they used a lot of mules yes we had trucks we had caterpillars to build to bulldoze but it was actually easier to use these mules and what's interesting about those mules is that they were reclaimed <laughs> in a sense they were part of the original borax mule team that would bring the borax from death valley to mojave to make hand soap so they used those mules then uh the because they were no longer doing that uh with mules or using cars and trains. They use the mules to actually drag these pipes uh, all along the Eastern Sierra. What was also interesting about this is they hired everyone. They said we want to hire as many people as possible to work as much as possible. Um, so they actually had, when you think about um, like diversity, these pockets of cultures. So they had uh, immigrants, they have uh, Chinese, they had uh, indigenous, they had Mexican, they had you know just everything, uh, white, Caucasian, um, Irish, Every group of people, they all worked together to build this aqueduct. It was very unique. It's probably one of the first times that, other than looking at the Transcontinental Railroad, where you had mul uh, multiple diversity working on a project that had a fair wage. Uh, but uh, nonetheless, very interesting. Some fun facts about this aqueduct is that it's obviously still used today. Um, but... Um, when they first turned it on, the siphon was so strong and it actually crushed the pipe and had to, then it popped back open again. Uh, but anyway, uh, so it brought a tremendous amount of water. Well, why was this important? Well, again, we needed the water in Los Angeles. Uh, we were still looking at just free range, open range for cattle. After this opened up, the San Fernando Valley, uh, in fact, there's a song called the San Fernando Valley by Roy Rogers. Uh, they start singing it and saying that this is cow country, it's oranges and citrus, and it was just like the, the American dream had then became to fruition because you could do just about anything. In fact, there was so much water in excess in Los Angeles that they put sprinkler systems. Maybe you've been hiking in Griffith Park um, and you've seen the old broken rusty sprinkler systems that are all over the hillsides. They actually had so much water that they put sprinkler systems on the mountains on purpose and then made everything green. Mind you, Los Angeles was not a green area. Now, we are a Mediterranean climate. We do have some precipitation, but not to the amount that we had adapted the city to. So we had excess water. They're making everything green. Here's some photos of uh, right after the aqueduct opened, how things started changing. Here's a, a aerial photo of West Hollywood. There's the Santa Monica Pier in 1909. Here we look at the San Fernando Valley. Uh, this is looking up from on top of what was Topanga, uh, sorry, Topanga Canyon. Uh, here's Mulholland Drive, 1920s. Here's some you know, people looking out at the ranches. So I show this because you've been to these places now and know that that's not what it looks like. So as you can tell, I mean, even looking at 1922, you know, to 2022, that's 100 years. But look at how much this has changed in that time span. 100 years really isn't a long time, um, especially looking at it geologically. That's just a, a, a grain of sand in the bigger hourglass of time. <coughs> Excuse me. So let's look at this here. I'm going to have to learn how to fix that, the be popping in and out. So look at population growth. So 1913 is when the Los Angeles Aqueduct opened. So notice the flux of people between 1910 all the way to 2010. So as we can see, we've gone from here, this the flat line being zero. Uh, we're looking at perhaps uh, 50,000 people at one point, all the way up to now almost 10 million in population in Los Angeles. So... Uh, they uh, a lot of this growth was due to the aqueduct opening itself because that provided a lot of opportunity. Uh, where does our water come from now? Uh, this is from the Los Angeles Department of Water and Power. As we can see, that 52% of it is imported from Northern California and the Colorado River. Uh, about 30, uh, 30 to 36% is from the Los Angeles aqueduct. We get reclaimed water and groundwater. How do we use the water in Los Angeles? Uh, as we can see, single-family homes use 38% of this water. Multi-family residences uh, like uh, duplexes, large condominiums, apartment complexes, they get 32, and then commercial industry gets another 30%. Well, why is this important? You know, you'd think there'd be a lot more water being used from the Los Angeles aqueduct. Well, uh, within the last 15 years, the so I digress, but. 
where the water was coming from, there was a lake called Owens Lake. Uh, the lake itself was big enough that there were paddle boats going back and forth on it. Uh, the lake itself went dry, completely dry, in the late 1920s. Uh, the lake would have been dried anyway, but it had been accelerated because that lake did, was a terminal lake, meaning it didn't have an output for that water. It only had input through the uh, Owens River, so it only had an input. So by creating an, you know, by diverting the water away from the lake, it didn't have an input or, or an output, and it just evaporated uh, at a rapid rate. It would have evaporated anyway, but just not as soon. Um, so anyway, that being said, the lake went dry, uh, and then because the lake went dry, as water evaporates, the mineral content is left behind. So they noticed, especially in 1998 or so, they re realized that because of the winds in the high desert, would actually blow that material, the sand and salts, into the atmosphere. So they started the Owens Lake Water Project. It was a mitigation project put on because of... Um, the Environmental Protection Agency, uh, Great Basin Programs, uh, had sued the Department of Water and Power uh, to maintain uh, the particulate matter that's becoming airborne. Anyway, so about 60 plus percent of the Owens River now goes back into the lake, and so we get less in Los Angeles. And this all started at the beginning of our last drought. Uh, the reason being is because it was something between five and $7,000 a day that the Department of Water and Power had to pay the federal government, including the White House, is in penalties for not being within compliance of the particulate matter that was, they had to keep it down. So they were able to create ponding systems, sprinkler systems that... Uh, put enough water on the lake to offset what would be evaporated to keep the dust down. And so we, about 60 plus percent of the water in the river, the Owens River actually is now diverted back into the lake. Uh, the lake itself, even if they were to put more water in it, it is not palatable. You cannot drink it. It has a high um, value, it always was, a high value of salt uh, and arsenic levels within it, so it's not drinkable. But uh, But anyway... Where is the water in California? Okay, so here's a little map showing uh, water storage and stuff. Um, so as we can see, we're down here in Los Angeles area. We can see that there's the California Aqueduct that runs uh, from the right along the Central Valley. That was an important piece because during the, our last major drought, um, the farms along the Central Valley were not allowed to take water from the California Aqueduct because of the way the rules are set and water rights of who gets priority. We can see the Los Angeles Aqueduct to the right, and all of these little boxes are reservoirs. So as you can see, down the bottom, there's Castaic Lake and Pyramid Lake that are down there. So very briefly, we'll talk about well water. So we do get some water from well water. Well, what does that mean? Well, it rains. The water sits on the surface and slowly sinks down. So this diagram here is showing the examples that we have, what we consider the year line, the decades, and then the century lines, meaning that the water that we're sucking out of the lowest part, it took centuries for that water to go all the way down to the bottom. So we're just siphoning it up like a straw. It takes hundreds of years for that water to replenish. Uh, the other thing that's important to notice is that because these layers exist, if you pull all the water out, the land will actually subside. It will sink down. Um, I compare this in my lectures usually by looking at uh, chocolate pudding. You guys have all had pudding at some point. It's a powder. You add water, it fluffs up. But if it sits too long in the refrigerator, it starts to evaporate. And when it evaporates, the pudding settles down and tears apart. Uh, when it starts cracking apart, it, you can't just add water and mix it up again. It never does quite well. Same thing here. As we learned that you know, with the land subsidence, we can't just add water to it and it just puffs back up. It doesn't redo itself um, like that. You know, we can't just mix it up like we would with uh, with cooking. But uh, but nonetheless, so the, these are some, some things to keep in your your back mind. Uh, moving forward, this is a great image showing uh, California uh, drinking, California dry. So what was interesting is this map was put on. Uh, through a couple different organizations, the color represented when we were in a peak drought. This was, you know, within um, 2015-ish around there. Uh, this was the peak of our drought where we were. We didn't really feel it here in California, lost in Southern California, because we paid the premium to have the water, but other places did. They had what was called um, yard browning, where they would go around with a, a booklet 
and it'll look, it'll look at your yard and go, mm, your, your grass is too green, you get hit with a penalty. Um, but that was just was showing those regions that were either experiencing, at this point you can see it's just severe, extreme, and exceptional drought. So these were that was the first layer on this map. And then I they showed what water bottle companies are in those er, er, uh, sorry, areas. So as you can see, areas of exceptional drought, you've got uh, several bottling plants for Arrowhead, you've got several for Dasani, and you also have some for Aquafina. What's interesting about Aquafina and Dasani is Aquafina is owned by Pepsi, so it's the same water they put in Pepsi products, and Dasani is owned by Coca-Cola, which is what they put in Coca-Cola products. So yes, California was in a major drought. Who got priority? These businesses did because they were buying tap water at less than eight cents a gallon. Eight cents a gallon, you bought a little Dasani bottle at the college for three dollars. So think of the, mar the the profit margin on that. And then we can see uh, Crystal Geyser. There's two locations here. There's the one uh, actually is right outside of Lone Pine in a town called Olancha, and then there's one up in the Northern California. Um, other things that are interesting to speak of very quickly. Is Arrowhead in particular? Arrowhead sold out. It's owned by Nestle. Um, Nestle is, uh, they own obviously Nestle chocolate, but they own um, most of your freezable foods. They own DiGiorno, Stover, stuff like that. So they have a really big market, and that's you know, Nestle Waters itself. But uh, interesting to say nonetheless. So let's talk about something since we're talking about water resources, which would be uh, drought and earthquakes. So uh, there's a lot of research going into this. Is there a correlation with drought and earthquakes? And it's really split down the line. Some people say absolutely not. Some people say they, that there is. Some people go, well, there is, is there a thing called earthquake weather? Is there not? Um, but uh, nonetheless, we'll continue to bring in this topic. So as groundwater is depleted, we are finding that California's valleys are dropping in elevation. So the Central Valley, during the last drought of the, you know, early 2000s, uh, some of those areas dropped up to 16 feet, which means that the elevation as a whole depleted because they sucked all the water out to use in vegetation. Yeah, you water the ground, but the plant takes most of that water. Uh, the landscape in California is known to fluctuate in elevation, specifically doing dealing with water. We find that when there's a heavy snowpack along the Sierra. The Sierra actually are able to push down a little bit, and which causes other things to lift up, and then vice versa. So there is this um, equilibrium that occurs. Um, but as water is pumped away from the San Andreas Fault, less moisture is there to glue it together, which some people believe that, that brings in the, the susceptibility of earthquakes. Because water, uh, well, first, uh, when learning about earthquakes, certain waves cannot pass through liquids. So the more saturated a soil is, it actually prohibits uh, certain waves to bypass. But the other piece is that when you have more moisture in your soil, it's more fluid in that sense. And I'm not talking about like mud. I'm talking about just moist dirt. Um, but when you completely dry it out, it fractures and breaks and cracks more. Uh, so it'll be interesting to see if there's a correlation. In fact, there are some maps that show uh, areas of drought. Uh, the correlation with them in relation, you know, within their relationship of fault lines, and looking at the magnitude of earthquakes that have come out of there. So here's an interesting uh, diagram to kind of piece that in. So here we have, uh, in particular, the Garlock Fault. Interesting. Uh, this is an older image. The Garlock Fault is an offshoot of the fault that caused that big earthquake in Ridgecrest uh, in 2019. But here is the San Andreas Fault. We have some compression zones, the Sierra Madre Fault. Uh, the Sierra Madre Fault is part of um, the uh, mountains that go, uh, oh, they parallel the 210 and they actually end at Vasquez State Park. Um, so you've got that. These are G uh, GPS stations, but showing that we have all these additional faults zoning in on this compression zone along the San Andreas Fault, which is really not that far from where we are. We're, we're just over here. So, you know, that's why there's additional research going into earthquakes and looking at how the fact that we continue to, you know, especially now, we went through over 10 years of severe drought. Now we've gotten a little more moderate with the amount of precipitation we've received. Will we be expecting anything, you know, in the future? All right. A lot of information, I know, but again, I, I guess, like I said from the beginning from this course, this class is supposed to be an exciting, fun class. I hope that you walked away with something. There's, I can give an entire lecture on just the Owens Valley. Um, I was very fortunate. My father uh, worked for the Department of Water and Power for 45 years, uh, so I got to be there firsthand. I was actually there 
uh, in 98 on, uh, helping them come up with ideas on how to mitigate the water project, how to find additional resources. So I, I have a lot of background knowledge on that. And who knows? Maybe there'll be a video later that pops up on that. Uh, so I can share some of my photos, my research, part of my master's, my, my bachelor's, my master's, uh, and other graduate work at other institutions all dealt with the Eastern Sierra, in particular, looking at Owens Lake. So there might be something coming up later on that. But uh, Again, thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed this, and, uh, and we'll talk soon.